Bonju Habari Saleo. My name is Daniel Adeni, a professional officer at Ekle Africa. My name is Sinetem Bamtetwa, an intern at Ekle Africa. My name is Paul Curry, manager of the Urban Systems Unit at Ekle Africa. On behalf of Ekle Africa, the African Centre for Cities, Our Future Cities and Partners, I'm excited to welcome all of you to the Rise Africa 2021 Action Festival. Rise Africa has been growing as a platform of thinkers, doers and enablers, committed to inspiring action for sustainable cities. Rise Africa is about building active networks across academia, government, private sector, civil society and the arts. Our entry point is not based on articulating problems followed by proposing solutions, but rather on celebrating our cities as places of innovation and culture, while asking what more can we do to make them sustainable, inclusive and vibrant. This festival is hosting 46 sessions from across 16 countries in Africa and the world. Every session aims to share new ideas, showcase ongoing actions and launch new initiatives by bringing participants together to chart a new route forward. We hope that the festival program will inspire you to commit to one of more specific actions that you or your organization will take on. As this session closes, you will be redirected to a survey in which you can articulate these actions. We will follow up on these committed actions throughout the year and offer resources, connections and support. In this way, we are testing the idea that events can galvanize actions and we hope that you will join us in this effort. Beyond the session, there are many ways to take part in the festival. Register for further sessions. Vote for your favorite in the photo competition. Watch a variety of inspiring video provocations. Test your knowledge of African cities from our daily quiz. And listen and dance to the Rise Africa 2021 playlist. We hope that you will make all the attempts to reach out to new people and build long-lasting connections. Before we begin, it is important to note that this session is being recorded and that by participating, you are consenting to be recorded. All the recordings will be available on the program page after the festival. And may I say that creative expression is vital for creating new features for our cities. So we invite you to enter this session in the spirit of creativity and dreaming. Thank you very much. One, when people ask me where I'm from, I tell them I am from red dirt and green hills Endless mango trees whose small sun of a fruit is always within arm's reach. Smells so sweet your stomach speaks in small roars of impatience as you sip your cup of chai waiting for meals to finish cooking. I am from the sounds of my people. Language is so rhythmic you think we spoke in song. The melodies of matatu conductors waving on crowded city streets and the crow of roosters calling the sun from behind the horizon in the village. Two, when people ask me where I am from, I tell them, I am from a country mispronounced into modernity by wandering white men, from big men with small minds who stole the spoils of our struggles with no shame or foresight. I tell them I come from those who resisted, those whose dreams defied their bullets even after their breath was stolen from their bodies. Three, when people ask me where it is I'm from, I tell them I am from a new story about this country, this continent, this world, a new tale told by new authors, unafraid to wield the pen as a small spear, our ancestors as shield, our history as armor, as we use our words to help write this world anew. Yeah. My name is Tim Desi, a director with CCR NGO based in Tanzania and uh, also an expert in sanitation. I want to take this opportunity to welcome every one of you in this session where we will be looking at urban taboos on sanitation and how celebrations have been used as a strategy to challenge these taboos. In a minute, my colleague Adriana will be uh, talking about how this approach on the topic of taboos have been addressed and why celebration may be an interesting entry point to address taboos. But before this, I just want to go over housekeeping rules and uh, issues for the sessions. Number one, 
this session is talking about taboos. So please be respectful of others' points of view. And if, if you don't agree with them, please also be mindful that some of the topics discussed may make people feel uncomfortable. And also, please keep uh, your microphone off when you are not speaking. And we encourage you to keep your camera on so we can see each other during our conversation. However, the session will be recorded. So if you are not happy to have your camera on, that's also fine. Uh, we understand there might be people from uh, French speaking. And if you want to ask in French, there will be uh, a room for translation for that. Now, uh, because of time, I would like to introduce my colleagues, Adriana Allen from the Development Planning Unit of University called London to introduce the theme that we will, we will address during the session. Back to you, Adriana. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. Um, hello to all and welcome to all and very warm, um, happy Africa Day. Um, as Tim said, I just want to say a very few words. We have a, a very rich session, uh, so I don't want to delay uh, the discussion that is to come. Um, but first of all, to explain a bit, uh, where did the impetus for this session came? And it came very much from um, a project uh, called um, Overdue, uh, tackling the sanitation taboo across um, uh, urban Africa. And in this project, uh, I guess the first point that we were, like many of you, really bothered and disturbed by the fact that although sanitation has been declared a human right uh, many decades ago, we still know that at least 60% of the urban population across Africa uh, lack any form of adequate sanitation. But furthermore, what we notice uh, is that uh, we, in a way, we plan, we run cities, we leave cities like if feces and urine were not part of them. Uh, and this is what got us to talk about the taboo of sanitation and the many, sa the many taboos within sanitation um, with a name to to challenge those taboos, to change the conversation. What we want to do in this session doesn't only relate to sanitation, but relates to many other taboos, many other unspoken issues uh, that are still very much present in African cities. Um, and what we feel is that it is important to bring them to the fore, uh, first of all, to identify what are these taboos, what do they do, uh, what do they silence, who do they alienate, exclude, uh, stigmatize uh, and, and why and how can we challenge that. So very much when we are talking about taboos we need to bear in mind that we are talking about unspoken rules that uh, travel over time, over history, that uh, imply a prohibition, things that we shouldn't do, we shouldn't talk about, uh, we shouldn't question and very often they do that with very oppressive consequences. Uh, and this is why we talk about challenging those taboos. And more specifically, we thought that perhaps it was productive to focus on the potential of celebration as a way of challenging and disturbing taboos, of changing that conversation. Um, what do we mean by celebration? Celebration can have many forms, many faces. We are talking about um, dance, songs, uh, humor, uh, street plays, um, many forms of visual arts, even of, uh, uh, of writing, um, radio shows and so on. Different ways that might be sensitive enough uh, and allow us to have those conversations that otherwise we try to put to the side. So in challenging uh, different types of taboos across African cities through celebration, what we see is a possibility for decolonizing uh, cities and the way they are lived, run and planned. And when we talk about decolonizing, we are not talking only about the oppressive um, structures and, and forms of regulation, social regulation that were established during colonial time, but we need to recognize that there are many more, many 
historical, but also many uh, contemporary forms of uh, oppression that are still very much alive and need to be challenged. I'm talking about patriarchy, I'm talking about xenophobia, um, and we will talk about many more. So this is in a nutshell the invitation to explore the possibilities, but also the challenges that celebration as a means to decolonize taboos uh, might bring uh, to us as, as something that we might want to embrace to explore through our, throughout our practice, whether we are activists, academics, working in NGOs, working within communities and with communities and so on. Um, I don't want to delay much uh, more uh, the start of the conversation. Um, we hope to have a, a dynamic discussion. We have plenty of time after each of the presentations and contributions for everyone uh, in the session to put to the fore their views. As uh, Tim mentioned before, if you feel that you want to share something that you don't want to be recorded, just say off the record, and we will make sure that that's edited out of the final um, um, recording. Uh, so without further ado, I'm, I'm going to introduce um, a Mentimeter, just a question for all of us to answer. Uh, Alvan, if you can perhaps help us with the slide, and I will just say a few words. And we are not going to, we're going to have a go at this question and, uh, and then come back to it at the, end, uh, uh, at the end of the session. So the question is, what do you think are the taboos in urban Africa that need to be challenged? I talk about a few, you might have more. We are asking you to enter, to use, go to Mentimeter at www.menti.com Use the code shared on the screen, 59593622. And then I think that you have up to three options. So very briefly with a few key words, enter a different taboo yeah, in each of those three options that we have. And we will come back to that very shortly. So we give you a couple of minutes for that. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. I guess if you want to introduce the first uh, the first round of presentations, the floor is yours. Thank you. Tim, I think you're muted. Yeah, now I want to introduce Mary Lebron, the research fellow for the Overdue Project, who will lead us in a short survey exercise about urban taboos. I think this is the one that uh, Adriana has already introduced but Nelly will provide further instructions on it. Welcome, Nelly. Thank you, Tim. Um, actually, I think Adriana introduced it perfectly. Um, so it's just to say that we look forward to hearing additional taboos that you might want to tackle, challenge, decolonize, and we hope to come back on these answers in the final discussion to discuss which types of celebrations uh, could tackle these taboos and what are the potential and the limits. And I'll do it in French. Uh, bienvenue à tous. Donc, je vais faire écho à ce que vient de dire uh, Adriana. Vous pouvez cliquer sur le lien uh, www.monti.com pour introduire uh, le nom des tabous, nommer les tabous uh, que vous aimeriez qu'on discute au sein de cette session. Euh, on va les accumuler euh, au fil de la session. On espère revenir euh, sur ces éléments dans la discussion finale euh, pour euh, discuter quels sont les types de célébrations, euh, leur potentiel et leurs limites qui permettraient euh, d'aborder ces différents tabous. Thank you very much, Tim.
Now, yeah, thank you, Nelly, for a, a brief introduction. Although you've spoken in in French, I hope there will the the. the there has been some translation in English for those people who could not follow in French. And now I want to invite uh, Richard from Arezi, who will now briefly introduce our first film uh, from Mwanza in Tanzania. Welcome, Richard. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tim. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Prosper from Arad University, a research assistant from Arad University. And thank you for the opportunity to go first. <clears throat> so I want to introduce to you this video, which is part of this uh, project, which uh, uh, investigates on sanitation injustices and looking for ways to bring justice into sanitation especially on the concept of taboos. So this video is a video showing the experience of a sanitation festival that took place in Mwanza in December 2020. So I will come you all to watch the video. Thank you. We also have our, let's put it, our taboos that we think, we thought that sanitation is a very delicate issue when we are going to talk about it, people associate with the dirty, with the bad smell. And, and, and now what are you talking about? Do you want to accuse us that we don't use sanitation? Do you want to, do you think we want to talk about sanitation? Let's talk about other things which are clean. Uh, this is Mwanza Federation. They're doing a quieter during the sanitation festival. It's a big thing here today, here in Mwanza in the hillside. We tried to organize this sanitation festival to, first of all, bring to the fore the agenda of sanitation across the population, to bring together stakeholders from the public, private, and popular sectors to share this very important problem and get to them to understand and to give their views about the sanitation issues. We organized the officials from WASA, the public institution which is responsible for providing sanitation water in Monza City. We invited people, NGOs like federations, which are very important in Mwanza, which are constructing pit latrines, government departments, private sector, the, and the community. It was first of all organizing Mabatini, which is a ward, which is really poorly saved in terms of sanitation. A large part depends on off-grid sanitation, a largely not modified pit latrines. And those, there are also quite a proportion number of people who do not have own sanitation services, especially those who are living on the hills where it's very difficult to dig deep. And secondly, it's an area also where there is shortage of water, meaning that even if you are able to provide sanitation today, it will not be possible to use flush system because of limited water, especially on the hills. So I found that there is a fear of uh, the low income earners to interact with the officials, to discuss issues around sanitation. So the festival was a tool to bring these people in a way they are like enjoying because there were some dramas, there was a lot of uh, exhibition there. People they are enjoying at the same time discussions using local language about their sanitation. Men and women, old and the young, school children and 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 nine school children meeting and interacting to discuss this one with the officials also even sanitation listening and understanding from this perspective. This was one of the media. Uh, reason. Second reason was that we thought of organizing it in a place where we'll touch the ground, meaning that in one of the neighborhoods, one of the communities which are really have a serious problem of sanitation, where these issues, when they are discussed, when experiences are given out by the, by the participants, one can relate to the place where we are. Because we could have organized the meeting in a hall in the city council. We could organize the meeting hall in a, in a, in a, very, in a, in a, in a hotel. But we thought that it's important to organize it in, a, in the ground where these issues are taking place and where they can be observed. And there one can put a finger like that area there, like those houses there, then you people really have the feeling. And even the officials who are there, then will have really feel what the people are talking about. When we use the dramas, when we use dances, 
when we engage the school, the school children to show the experience of the toilets they use at home, to sketch out in, the, in a form of a competition. Show us as the toilet you use at home and the toilet which would best like and why you, this one you hate it and this you don't know, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't like it or you like the best this one. These were very important uh, communication tools for us because the kind of people are trying, they are talking in a form of a drama, in a form of uh, dances, but the message was sent home. Meaning if, at the same time, people are laughing the way that people are putting it. At the, on the other hand, it's also underlining very important uh, uh, facts of what is happening on the ground in reality. Something you will find it very difficult if you, you have written a paper or PowerPoint presentation to talk about and to send the message on a practical ground or with the flavor of what is happening in reality on the ground. Using those artists where like drawings, it was exposing women, their daily experience. I mean, women now they're coming up to either cement or giving some more elaboration and uh, explanation about what the kids have, have started. And another thing is using the federation. We had those uh, federations who are also building toilets. So it was giving other community confidence to speak when they saw their fellow women, they are fully involved in, in building toilets. Uh, it's a combination. Despite their limited resources, communities are very proactive. They know that they have a problem. They know that it is, it is, there is an equal distribution of sanitation services. They know that they've not been receiving justice, especially those in the low income settlements. They know this one things, but they are ready. They are also calm and willingly seeing this challenge to, in a way of saying that we are ready to join forces to, to solve the problem. The Muasa found it an opportunity to explain also what plan they have for that area what challenges they are facing, not being able to provide sanitation in this and this and this localities. At the same time, do it in a manner which is not a confrontational. It's not an, a, an encounter between people who are complaining, people are supposed to provide services, but it was an encounter between people who are seeking support from each other and who want to be assisted to solve their problem. We also want to be assisted by the communities to be able to address some of the problem of people who do not have sanitation. To be to be to address especially problem of, of, of sanitation on the hills and what can be done and they have to listen to the people's views. At the same time, people want also Moasa to, to assist them to improve their sanitation. E, for example, telling providing some water so they can link up with this simplified sanitation system, which requires some amount of water to support in the process of, of digging trenches using machines and grills which can, can, can cut through the, the, the hard rocks and, and, and which individual cannot do on their own. To negotiate and facilitate access to land for laying the pipes and whatnot. These are issues which Mwasa can do as a public institution. The environment which is, uh, which is entertaining is also very critical because this makes you open up without the ill feeling that I'm being accused for not having done my part and, 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 and. and therefore both all the parties involved with find that a common ground where you can talk and, and chat and share and uh, at the same time joke there are a lot of jokes which are making which are making point which are driving point home which are underlining critical concerns but they are not taken painfully by any of the parties involved for for the presentation that, uh, for the video that has been played. And now I want to invite uh, Prof. Kombe for, for Q&A questions. If, please, Prof. Kombe. You're muted, Professor Kombe. Sorry, sorry. Hello, colleagues. I trust that you have enjoyed the video. And I hope that you want to we have a number of burning issues, questions, elaborations which you are speaking. But the aim of the discussion is essentially to try to give you an opportunity and provoke you to ask questions, to ask us, myself, team who was in the, in the program, as well as first and other colleagues 
about these sanitation issues in Mwanza in terms of the opportunity given and the challenges or what you, the issues which you want to see clarification. We also want to use this to explore the thing, what is in this context, meaning the, 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 the festival approach. What do you think about it? What, where do you see uh, gaps? Where do you see opportunities? And we also want to, to ask questions, to make comments, give, give us, raise your hand, and then we'll give, give you the opportunity to provide whatever comment you have. You are most welcome, members, colleagues, if you want to ask any question, seek any clarification. Um, Kambo, we have a question in the chat, if I can read it out to you. Maya Adams says, have okay. you found that women are able to speak about sanitation when these creative and festive spaces are created? So about the involvement of women speaking about sanitation. How, how you found the women are able to speak out. Okay, good. Tim, you want to answer that question? I think, oh yes. I Hello, can, Tim. Uh, I can respond, yes. When we had a festival, as uh, you have seen from the video, uh, we had also women and men coming together. And uh, during the conversation, we also provided space for women to be able to share some of their experiences. So although initially they were a bit shy because uh, issues on sanitation sometimes as what we have known that sometimes it's very hard for women actually to express themselves in front of other people, but we probed them and they, they were able to open up and be able to share some of their concerns. And one of the questions that we asked them was, who is responsible to maintain and clean the toilets? And uh, it was very obvious that uh, women were more, much more responsible for that. And uh, some of course said men also are responsible for maintenance of the toilet. So there was an opportunity for that. Prof. Combe. Yes. I'll just add that um, when we talk about taboo, th that was a place where women were a bit hesitant, particularly taboos which relates to menstrual period, the taboo which relates to how girls handle their problems in this context where there is no water, where there is no good sanitation uh, facilities up in the hills. And these were areas where they were a bit hesitant to talk about it because that relates to individual experiences. And, uh, but when you talk, when we try to move out and talk to them outside the wider public, definitely they were talking about a lot of other experiences which they couldn't share in public. Mm -hmm. Is that clear? Is that, you want an elaboration on that? Yes, yes, thank you. Um... I think just as a follow up to that question, I was wondering, it, not to take too much space, but um, I think your answer about, you know, women taking initiative to then say we're going to clean um, these, uh, these toilets, I think is a very interesting example. Do you have any other examples of follow up, for example, after these celebration events happen or... Um, what 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 is has there been any been any follow up and are there any examples of how that's happened and um, how have they been received? Yeah, uh, and I can respond to that question. Uh, uh, one of the issues that was happening is that uh, at that school that the to the, first, the celebrations were taking place, the school had no toilets at all even a single drop. So because we brought up the utility, we brought up the municipality and the many officials. So there was an agreement, an action plan from that day that uh, the utility will consider providing sanitation facilities for children at a school. And this is very, very important, particular to young girls and children uh, who sometimes they lose uh, the days to come to school because of menstruation. So we were able also to get stories from young girls how the lack of sanitation has been affecting their schoolings at their particular school. So the, the take home, the action that we were able to develop 
was that the utility was able to be committed to provide solution for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Hello. And uh, yes, someone with a question before we move to another video, because we have another video from Sierra Leone. Any question so far? I, I think that now, Claudie if we don't question, have a question, Tim Claudie has a question. Yes. Yes. Yes, um, Prof. I wanted to to know more. I mean, did you did you get the impression that the topic was actually talked about in the open for like for the very first time? Um, we've tried to to engage that same conversation in in DRC in 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 Ivory Coast as well through some of the of the work and. And, and, and some of the women, and including the women's organizations, were quite surprised. I mean, they were like, a bit like we were saying at the beginning, you know, why, why are we going to be talking about this? And, and then when we started, they just couldn't stop. They just want to go on and on and on. And they want to do more about it. I mean, do you get that feeling as well? Yeah, you are right. And in a way, when we started the presentation, there was a lot of shine away and people not being very comfortable when we talk about what we are going to discuss today, what is the agenda, what is our concern, what is the concern of the municipality and the, and the institution which are providing services in Mwanza. There, were, there was a, a citation of some kind and a, and a, a kind of enclosure. But eventually with the festival, with the kind of uh, elaborations and statements and the exchanges coming from dancers and gomas and the school children particularly citing cases and talking about it and challenging parents that we need this and this and these services, it's important for us. And becoming the ambassadors of change that brought in a, a kind of an opening the discussion. And it, Everybody then felt the mood. This is not something about me or about our household or about, about us in the marginalized groups. It is our collective concern. You are right, uh, Claudia. I can't hear. Am I muted? Tim, are you able to hear? Hello? Yes, I can I can hear. I can hear. Okay, fine. Fine. Is that okay, Claudia? Yes. Fine. Thank you. So another, another question? No? I have sorry, if there is time yes. for one more yes. before we yes. We move uh, to the next uh, next block. Um, this is a question to all of you who were involved in the in the festival in Mwanza, and I just want to share your views on uh, what was the one biggest surprise, the biggest thing that you didn't think about before uh, this change conversation took place. You were not perhaps aware before. Clearly, you were aware that open defecation was an issue, and you planned the celebration to bring that discussion yeah, in an entertaining and surprising way. But was there any aspect that you didn't see before that was quite revelatory for you as well as the organizers? To me, Tim, I, I hope you have several. To me, I find the, the environment for working, the conducive food, the friendly, the, the, the very socializing environment quite was a bit surprised because I thought initially it would be very difficult to get through with the local communities touching very sensitive issues, which is not often spoken in public and which is very private matter. <coughs> and the, the municipalities, I mean, the, 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 the sanitation, the water and sanitation <coughs> authority being brought to the public to be kind of being seen to have not done their part adequately, at least the marginalized groups. And that this is a, a place for poor people and they are fulfilling that we are, being we are being accused of not 
having the doing the proper thing in the city using facility just some standard, not having some of the not having trained and other. Therefore, my, my, my feel was that, and therefore looking at how the people are responding. But I was very surprised to see that it was not that way. People are eventually straight as a very important opportunity to exchange in a very friendly and in a very jovial way. At the same time, messages sinking down and people really realizing, yeah, this is our agenda. This is our collective action. We need to assist each other to be able to solve this. Therefore, to me, that was a surprise. Tim? Uh, yeah, I think the, you have said already, Prof. I think the, the other surprise was uh, to, to, to see how sanitation issues that was, has no values, but is now being promoted and being celebrated in a big way with the majority of people coming together. And then the other thing was the, the different stakeholders coming together, all key stakeholders in the city who are responsible for sanitation were able to come together to celebrate sanitation. Then I was joking with one of the health officers who was saying that uh, uh, people are used to celebrate uh, on issues like weddings, good stuff, but uh, you are celebrating <laughs> sheets. So we were raising the profile of sheets so that people can be able to talk about it in a good way and dancing out of sheets. Thank you. Okay. If there are Richard, no more questions. Okay. Not really, maybe just uh, to add about the participation of pupils. <clears throat> they were really engaged to the point that you, you wouldn't think maybe it's a concern to people of their age. No. So yeah. that was, uh, quite interesting yeah. and it was a surprise. Yes, I think you're right. You're right. S sanitation does not know the age, does not have age. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. There is one more uh, point by Barbara uh, on the chat. Barbara and everyone, just remember that you can unmute yourself and speak directly as well if you want. We are on a meeting, not a, <clears throat> a webinar. Hi, thank you. So now I was wondering about the relationship or if there was a relationship between the idea of the celebration and the holding of the celebration and any kind of advocacy agenda, like you spoke about how you had all sorts of groups there, youth groups, women's groups, but also all sorts of government officials. So when you did this, were you doing it with the hope that they would take particular actions or did you include in the celebration a kind of planning moment? Um, I don't know enough about the context to know who is responsible on these issues, but I just wondered if it had an action dimension and what your thoughts are on that. Thank you. Tim, you want to say something about it? Yes, I uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, it's very true that uh, when we design the festival on sanitation, we invited responsible people with an intention that uh, there will be sort of like the action forward. And uh, as what I have mentioned already, we, we invited uh, people from the utility who are managing water and sanitation in the city. We also invited the municipality and all these people are, have a responsibility to solve sanitation issues in the city. And uh, to give an example of the action, the school that we did the first of all did not have the toilets. And one of the key action that happened is that uh, the utility and the municipality were committed now to address sanitation at that particular school. So I, I totally agree with you that we had an intention on advocacy and co-production to bring other people together. That's fabulous, thank you. Thank you. Oh, when, where? <laughs> But 
to who or what is where. Thank you. Can we move on to the, the, if there are no other questions, can we move on to the next slide, to the next film? Video, okay, so now. Brian Makoroma from the Sierra Leone Urban Research Center will now introduce our second case study film. Brian. Just to jump in to say, Brian has been unable to join, so Awa Natu Bangura will be introducing the film instead. So Awa, over to you. Hi everyone, my name is Awanatu Bangura. This film you are about to watch is about the celebration of the Disability Day we did in Dwaza and Tomsimbe. They are in, they, the, the two community I just mentioned are informal settlement in Freetown. And please go ahead and watch the film so we can share our thoughts. With and in the past years have been working on disability in Sierra Leone with various organizations. In 2018, at Fit and City Council, I coordinated the disability sector by bringing together different stakeholders, including disabled people organizations, development partners, to a participatory planning process that gave disabled people the chance for their voices to be included in the current Transform Fit and Plan of Fit and since then, I've been working for the Sierra Leone Common Research Center, SLOC, with University College London, leading the implementation of the Action Research Project 802030, Assistive Technologies in Informal Settlement, funded by the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. This project has been in two settlements in Freetown to understand the aspirations for disabled people and other assistive technology users for example, wheelchair, coach, or spectacle users living in informal settlements in Freetown. 802030 research project works in two informal settlements, Tomsimbe and Wazak, with around 60 people, three quarters of whom are disabled people and assistive technology users. In the project, we encountered a lot of stigma about disability in the two communities and Freetown more generally. Because of this, our disabled participants had never come together as a group before. So we decided together to hold International Disability Day celebrations in Dwazak and Tomsimbe for the first time. For most participants, it was the first time they had participated in short a celebration. And the theme was, the future is accessible. Most participants confirmed that the celebration and Arishat has helped them overcome shame and stigma. Example, one of our participants in Freetown said, and I quote, before I was ashamed, but since I have been participating in the project, I feel my opinion is important. I was recently invited to, um, um, to talk at a workshop in a village um, in parts of Sierra Leone. And I remember I stood up to talk about inclusive development. And the first question I posed was um, whether um, my observation that there were no people with disabilities amongst the crowd that was gathered in a circle. And so I asked if there were any people with disabilities in the, in the village and there was a unanimous no between that there was nobody with disabilities and so at the end of my talk um, we decided to do a village tour to look at ways that we can improve access um, for older people and others so as we were going through this walk I noticed um, a child peering through the door of this hut and this child was drooling and so um, I asked the question, uh, whose child it was? And nobody responded. Anyway, we came back after the tour um, and somebody approached me and said, that was my child. And I said, well, why did you not bring that child um, to this meeting? And the person said, oh no, I dare not because I'll be provoked. It's not something we talk about, but my disabled child. 
um, the attitude of my uh, village people will be um, it's, it's very hurtful and so I never take that child out of my hut since that child was born it's always been in that hut um, and I was shocked and, and it really really pained me because here was a child with a, a, a cerebral palsy and that child does not come out, does not participate, does not, um, is always excluded. We need to have, um, to know, for the society to know that disabled people should not be stigmatized, they should not be excluded, they should not be discriminated. We are, um, we are equal members of society, we all have rights, we have rights to, um, to health, we have rights to education, we have rights to social activities. Uh, we have a lot of uh, other problems in this country where pregnant women seeking medical help will be spoken to badly that will, you don't even feel sorry for yourself, let alone you're getting pregnant. Um, so we need to change these attitudes as part of this conversation. Uh, and then I think people with disabilities need to be opened and, and open up and come up with these conversations as I'm doing now and, and I hope that would help many many other people. Richard found that while that the priorities of disabled of disabled residents are almost the same to the priorities of non-disabled residents, the challenges disabled people face in achieving them are different and much greater. The celebration brings together relevant community stakeholders to know disabled people's challenges after which some stakeholders showed commitment to work towards making a positive change. During the event of the, the International Day of Disabled People in Freetown, Yira, head of FedUp, talked about how FedUp had changed their attitude towards disability and how they want to mainstream it in the planning of informal settlements. Another important element the celebration looked into was creating awareness on the language people used to talk about disability in Sierra Leone, which is often negative and discriminatory. Before, we were not thinking of involving people of disability because we think they are disabled. We cannot involve them in the work that we are doing. We just think this guy is, is disabled. Whatever we have, we can give to them, but not to include them in our work. Not knowing that that was a wrong perception. But when we have the training to the 80, 20, 30 projects, that opened my mind. That opened the mind of the Federation. That opened the minds of every department in the Federation that we are doing wrong, injustice in our community to people that are disabled. But when we came to realize that, it is not a good attribute for us to practice. Then we decide to change. And when we have changed, we really change for good. I still have the banner, as you can see. This is the celebration for the banners. These are the historic things that keep changing my mind every day. For any time I enter into my office, I see this one, I say, thank God. I'm now part of people with disability and I've always worked with them in life. Now I have respect for them. I have to work with them as a team, and we need to work as, as a team. This banner also motivates me every morning. And it has been there from the beginning when we have that celebration. I hang it on a particular one. I'm very happy to see it every day. Before the celebration of Disability Day, we used several research methods to map out the aspirations of participants. During the research discussions, we introduced the idea of doing a banner that will capture in a tangible, colorful, and creative way the aspirations that participants had been discussing in the last weeks. This was inspired by the multiple use of lapa fabric in Freetown and the skill of tailors and seamstress in the city, including one of our participants, a tailor who was also a person with disability. Participants were skeptical. They were unsure if they had the skills to make a figure. Some had not used scissors before. 
The creative and unstructured nature of the activity was something participants we are not used to do. For me, transportation is so high. They did, it, it was so difficult in Sierra Leone to have transport, to move around, especially with disability, living. So I asked everyone out there to help and to support people with disability to achieve their goals. Different to other participatory activities that we had been doing, this one created an instant collaboration between participants and provided a relaxed atmosphere. For example, in Tomsimbe, where they chose inclusive mobility, people drew things that affected their mobility like buses, taxis, rough roads, sloop hills, spectacles, mobile phone, a wheelchair, and a hanging toilet. The banner captured many of the discussions of the last month and was also physical objects that could be used for future activities. By creating something new together and using creativity as a new avenue to explore their everyday life and aspirations, participants were able to work as a group to showcase and celebrate things that they would like to achieve as a community. So we also have Dr. Abs, Dr. Abdullahi, who you saw talking on behalf of the Dorothy Springer Trust there in the video, talking about um, taboo and stigma around disability. So I'd like to invite any questions. And I see straight away, Vanessa has posted in the comments, in working to counter stigma, it's imperative that efforts focus not just on broader society, but also on persons with disabilities themselves. Um, and I think what I was talking about, that was part of the intention of working on the collective activity on the banners because the disabled people in the community we were working in prior to that point were very hesitant to identify as disabled and so didn't come together to work together. But I don't know if either Dr. Abs or Alwa have any responses to that or if we have any more questions. So um, Dr. Abs, would you like to, to speak to this question about countering stigma and disabled people's own attitudes to disability. Um, you're muted, Dr. Abs, you have to unmute. Let me just, let me just get my mic on. <laughs> I just realized okay. I'm muted. Um, well, thank you very much. I, I have been following since the start of the program, but I've been, I've been dipping in and out. So apologies for that. But um, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's a very good question uh, about the, um, you know, this, uh, disabled people's attitudes um, to this. I think um, to some extent we are, we're probably just as bad as the non-disabled person in terms of how we think of ourselves. I mean, one, one way I look at this mainly is around people saying, well, it's like using the word, I'm sorry, I don't know whether I'm going to offend anybody, but it's like, you know, in America, people talk, talking about a nigger. And then, then you say, well, if somebody else is, uses that word against you, you feel offended. But if you use it, if you you using it yourself, then it's, it seems like it's okay. Well, I think that's a similar thing with people with disabilities. We can call ourselves different. Uh, we can call ourselves names that we want to call ourselves, but we don't feel offended as that, and we provoke each other. But then, when somebody else is, does that, then we feel offended. So I think that's a sort of attitude generally that we have towards ourselves. Um, but I think on the other hand, in terms of uh, um, how society view, um, view us and, and some of the things that are so difficult. I mean, I, I, unfortunately, I think I missed my video. Um, it was really about the, the difficulty of coming out and saying things in the public that causes a lot of, and I think there's a deep thing about this. It causes a lot of depression um, to us. I mean, because... You have a lot of people that just close in because they're not, they're really worried about saying things about themselves in public. Um, so, for example, if you take the case that I cited in the video, um, you know, I, this is a very close friend of mine. He would never, ever say this in public about how he finds it difficult chatting to, to girls and their response. Generally, he sees that as provocation that he will feel he feels really offended about that. So I think 
Um, there's a lot of things to say around this. I don't know whether I think I'm just fishing a bit or whether I've, I've gone straight to the point, but I think uh, maybe I need a little bit more clarification on the question too. Okay, great. Uh, perhaps, and I, I see we have some more questions coming through from our Francophone participants that maybe Claudia can do, but before that, Awa, did you have anything to say about um, how the celebration let, um, engaged with attitude change more broadly, but also amongst the disabled participants themselves? Oh, are you there? Sorry, I don't see you now. Well, do you want me to come back? Uh, um... Yeah, I was just trying to see if Awa wanted to make a response, but she seems to have disappeared. Sorry, Julian, I was disconnected. Please ask. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, Awa, did you have anything to say about the attitude change, um, both for the wider community, but also the disabled participants in the celebration themselves? Yeah, so when, when we did the, the celebration, we thought it fit that we should bring the stakeholders of the community and that effort was positive in the end when we had the feedback of the stakeholders. So for example, we brought the chief and the other community stakeholders, just like what the fed up chairman, chairman spoke about. Most time, most of the community stakeholders confirmed that they believe in disabled people behind in most of the development of the settlement. So in terms of planning, they were not putting them on board, they were not thinking about disabled people, but the celebration helped them to understand that inclusion is important. And as well, some of our disabled participants that we had, they also told us sensitive things that some of them we are ashamed to come in public. Like we had one of the disabled guy, he's a businessman, a famous businessman, but he just had his disability. He's now a visual impaired man. So he said, since he got his disability, he's been hiding in his house. But because of the celebration, he has regained his confidence again to come out and interact with the people. As well as other people, the celebration made a lot of impact in the life of disabled people, as well as the community people, the residents as well. Thanks very much, Awa. Um, I see we have some questions in French. Claudie, would you be able to... Um, I, I don't want to mangle the translation. Maybe you could step in and give us highlights of the questions in French. You're muted, Claudie. Okay, okay. So it is Emily's question. Um, she's asking, after the celebrations, um, did other people actually change their outlook? on those with disability? Did they actually change the way they viewed them? And then she says, um, do disabled people actually manage to feel like anyone um, in their community? Um, Nelly, if you want to, um, maybe I've missed some, but it's basically that, you know, did it change people's view on disabled, on disabled people and did it actually make it more possible for disabled people to live like no as everyone else in the community? Yes, just like I spoke earlier, the celebration made a lot of impact in the life of, because we, we not, it's not just for disabled people. When we did the celebration, we brought non-disabled residents as well as the disabled people. And there were a lot of testimony like the market women, that's a popular place people go to, to buy goods. And the language people use in terms of describing disabled people in Sierra Leone is one of a major issue as well, because most time people use pro provocative language to talk about disability. So that celebration as well was able to change the perception of non-disabled residents who attended the event that they never knew about the, the, some of the languages they used to talk about disability, but the celebration has helped them. As well as the disabled residents who we are shy to come out to interact because the celebration had never happened in the community. That was the first time it happened. And it's made a lot of impact in the life of disabled people 
And I've seen the, like, for example, we have this our participant that was shown in the video, Tina. She was still shy because she's young and she got her disability not too long ago. But when we had one of the popular inspiration by Dr. Hab, who is also part of this session, this the, 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 the message that Dr. Hab delivered on the celebration inspired her a lot. And now she has enrolled to Dr. Hab's training center. She's now learning computer skills. Initially, she told us, I am shy to come out, to interact with people. I think everything I think about myself now is, I think I cannot interact again with my community. But with this celebration now, I am confident again. I have regained my, my confidence. And now she's attending to the center, she's learning her skills. And she's been also bold as initially when we started. When we started even to interview Tina, you can't hear her voice when she talks. But now she can talk, she can perform, she can stand in front of people and show her talent. So I think the celebration made a lot of impact in both the disabled and the non-disabled residents. Dr. Abs, I don't know if you have something you'd like to add and also maybe because I know you've been involved in a lot more Disability Day celebrations beyond the two communities in Sierra Leone. So anything you want to add there? Well, I, I think um, now I said most of it, but uh, one is about the language, but also I think it's about people recognizing that people with disabilities um, are important um, people and people that contribute in society and as a result that people are able to see some of these talents in these celebrations i mean i remember the lad from um, the red uh, the scouts you know doing his dancing and all of that and and i think that was a big thing um that was really recognized uh, by the community knowing that people with disabilities are not just uh, useless human beings as they as we were normally classed here but there are people that can do things there are people that and can contribute and and I think taking that a little bit a step further is really think about um, uh, some of the the achievements and, and I think this is what some of these celebrations try to achieve um, in, in trying to show showcase profile successful disabled people and so that they become role models and and for me, I think the, the point that Awa made about the language is so important because you can see that as a result of this celebration, as a result of the collaboration with the, um, the, the community members, that this language is changing. I remember the first time we had a celebration where we brought in um, the, the, the chief and others. I mean, we talked about the, the, the language and this was something that was very, people were very uncomfortable because they talked about different languages here, have different ways of describing people with disabilities. Until we got to a, to a common point where we recognize that language change and people need to address uh, the individual rather than their disability. It became so obvious and this chief went back and stood up and said, now I'm going to tell my community, they're never going to call anybody as a cripple anymore. They're going to put the person first. So I think this celebration has a huge impact in the way they, they, they change it. But I think looking at it from an international development point of view, it's about the active participation of persons with disabilities. I think this is one day in the year that people with disability can participate and showcase and bring community members and bring government people and, and, and in, a, in a single place, uh, NGO workers and everybody to, to say, yes, we are, this is our day and we need to celebrate it. And this is the way we feel inside. And, you know, once you expose all that, then people start feeling better. And a, a case in point that I'm not going to go over everything what uh, Howard said is really uh, Tina. I mean, Tina was really, really closed in, in a community that was so difficult for her. And you know, because of that exposure that the celebration created for her, and the fact that she was able to join us in our center, she's a wonderful lady now, very brave. She's outspoken. Uh, you know, she stands her own ground very much. So the celebrations are fantastic. They do a lot. They make a lot of difference, really. Great. Thank you so much to Dr. Abs and Awa. I'm conscious of time and we have another short film about menstruation as a taboo. So I just have to say thanks again for, to Dr. Abs and Awa for giving us their insights on that, that case of celebration. And maybe we can move on to the next film. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much. Uh... 
une jeune fille qui a ses premières règles quand elle annonce ça à sa mère, sa grand-mère. Alors là, on lui donne des conseils sur la façon dont elle devrait se comporter dans son futur ménage. Parce qu'on s'attend maintenant à ce qu'elle puisse remplir sa vie de, de futures femmes. C'est très rare d'entendre des débats publics sur la menstruation, sur les douleurs menstruelles, spécifiquement les coliques. Et dans notre contexte, au moins dans la zone sud, nous appelons les coliques comme chilumi. Essas dores são vistas como algo normal que a mulher deve suportar. Donc on dira à la petite fille qui, qui a ses premières règles qu'elle est devenue une femme. Euh, des fois on lui explique ce que ça implique, des fois non. aussi le fait que les règles sont perçues comme quelque chose de sale. Donc on va dire à la petite fille euh, qu'elle doit se laver, qu'elle doit se changer, pas parce que, euh, pas par souci d'hygiène menstruelle en fait, mais on va lui dire qu'elle est carrément sale et que c'est l'impureté qui sort. Encore aujourd'hui en 2021, il y, a dans, il y a certaines régions où la petite fille n'a le droit de toucher à rien quand elle a ses règles et tout. Le fait de ne pas avoir accès à certaines nourritures ou à certains espaces, à une mobilité réduite en période de, de règles. Et ce schéma explique comment, à partir de restrictions comme celle-ci, les, les, les répercussions et l'accumulation des effets négatifs de ce stigma sur la question des, des règles qui arrivent à, à, à être connectées à un plus haut, au plus haut niveau avec toutes les problématiques des violences faites aux femmes des difficultés d'autonomisation aussi euh, économique et, et sociale des femmes. Et ce qui est important avec un, un schéma comme celui-ci, c'est voilà, la capacité que, que, que développent de plus en plus d'organisations de, de, euh, d'analyser la question des règles, qui, dont on pourrait dire qu'elle est euh, voilà, essentiellement un, un fait biologique, mais de l'analyser comme un fait social et comme un fait politique qui construise les, les, rapports, de, les rapports de genre. Donc ça fait aussi partie de, de la déconstruction d'un fait, fait biologique pour en faire en fait un, un fait social et au final relativement politique. À proprement parler, les règles de menstruation ne s'est faites pas, mais si en ville vraiment la chose passe inaperçue. Il y a une, une dimension un petit peu à la fois sanitaire et technique hein, qui se focalise surtout sur euh, l'absence de protections sanitaires, qui sont souvent appelées d'ailleurs des protections hygiéniques, hein, qui, ce qui évidemment peut renforcer l'idée que les règles qui ne seraient pas gérées avec des tampons ou des, des serviettes euh, voilà, sortant de, de jolies boîtes en carton seraient forcément des, des, règles, des règles sales. Un autre aspect qui est abordé, c'est la production locale donc de protection sanitaire qui peut aussi représenter un, une opportunité économique pour des groupements de femmes ou pour des, des coopératives de femmes, puisque le, le prix des protections est assez prohibitif pour de nombreuses femmes dans de nombreux pays, notamment quand ce sont des protections qui sont importées. En parallèle, de nombreux projets célèbrent la menstruation pour casser les stigmas, remplaçant les cérémonies d'initiation souvent moins marquées en ville et mettent les règles sur la place publique. En format de commémoration, cet assunt transcende les frontières du groupe AVE, ce qui signifie que cette euh, information chega à des personnes qui ne sont pas directement liées à l'assunt, mais qui besoin de l'information pour que puissent mudar à sua forme de ser, de estar et de penser. Et même pour les règles douloureuses, il y a encore cet amalgame-là qui est... Les règles douloureuses sont perçues comme le fait des femmes qui ne sont pas courageuses. Donc quand tu te plains des douleurs menstruelles, on te dit tu n'es pas une femme, tu n'es pas une vraie femme africaine, euh, tu dois supporter la douleur, tu ne dois même pas parler de ta douleur. Essas cólicas não são tratadas quanto mais cedo. Essas cólicas podem evoluir até um estágio avançado a ponto de não permitir que esta mulher consiga ter filhos. Há uma contradição aí. O nosso Sistema Nacional de Saúde 
que gratuitamente apoia as políticas que limitam a, o número de filhos, não tem as mesmas políticas para apoiar as mulheres que têm dificuldades para ter filhos. Não é, não é valorizada a possibilidade daquelas mulheres que enfrentam dificuldades para conseguir ter filhos. Quando vão para o Sistema Nacional de Saúde, simplesmente têm um tratamento precário que não lhes permite seguir o tratamento até conseguirem resolver o seu problema de saúde. Certaines femmes, certaines féministes, y compris celles qui, qui ont une approche plus de la santé, c'est vraiment important de faire ça à la fois pour déstigmatiser, hein, casser aussi beaucoup de stéréotypes et de préjugés qui sont aussi des formes de discrimination autour des règles, hein, le fait que quand on a ces règles, on peut pas faire certains, voilà, on peut pas faire certains métiers, on peut pas avoir accès à certains espaces publics. À, à la fois aussi pour les écoféministes, il y a une, un aspect aussi de, de célébration, hein, de quelque chose d'absolument vital. Hein. Les, les règles, c'est aussi, bah, c'est aussi la vie, hein, c'est aussi la, voilà, la reproduction, la procréation, et donc c'est quelque chose de évidemment fondamental. Et puis, bah, à côté de ça, il y a effectivement dans, dans, dans pas mal de d'espace, de, 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 et c'est pas simplement au sud, hein, c'est aussi, c'est aussi au nord, des femmes qui disent, laissez-nous, laissez-nous gérer ça. Et les femmes, voilà, ne veulent pas être non plus euh, ramenées à leurs conditions de femmes. Elles n'ont pas forcément envie que leur employeur ou leurs collègues sachent que, voilà, cette semaine-là, elles ont leurs règles et elles craignent justement que ça, ça renforce de nouveau cette idée que, ben, voilà, parce que les femmes ont les règles, ben, en fait, elles sont pas, elles ne sont pas disponibles tout le temps pour euh, être efficace sur le point, euh, sur un, sur un plan euh, professionnel. Donc on voit que là aussi, il y a à la fois des demandes, mais aussi des réticences autour de ces questions-là. Alors moi, en tant que blogueuse sexuelle, puisque mon champ d'action, c'est vraiment de décomplexer euh, la parole autour de la sexualité féminine, de tout ce qui est plaisir sexuel, donc, sur mon blog, je vais aborder des, des sujets comme la libido qui, qui monte pendant, pendant les règles. Donc, on a une hausse des libido. Je vais parler de masturbation pendant les règles. Je vais parler de rapport sexuel pendant les règles. Pour dire aux gens que c'est juste euh, euh, des débris euh, d'ovules qui n'ont pas fécondé, qui s'écoulent. for watching thank you very much for those who contributed to the film uh we've got emily with us maybe emily i don't know if you can mais emily tu, tu peux vous pouvez peut-être mettre votre votre caméra qu'on puisse vous identifier donc emily qui est euh, donc blogueuse sexuelle à sorry emily who is a, a sex blogger then in, in in abidjan in ivory coast who contributed uh, some of the film Unfortunately, we cannot have um, our friend um, Astrid from the Kivu. She's busy with all the volcano uh, crises around where she lives. Um, and we do have Katarina with us, of course, uh, which I'm, yeah, okay, I'm finding her now on the, on the screen, Katarina from, from Mozambique. So just to give a, a, a few seconds of background, um, the reason why we decided to to um to make that film is that we we noticed during the conversations that we've had over the last few months uh, through the overdue project uh the issue came up um the issue came up in relation to to sanitation um and we thought well you know this is something definitely that we need to that we need to explore um and um yeah well we were interested in finding out whether menstruation was the taboo of taboos so you know maybe that's something that we can we can discuss now um like you saw on the film we did find some examples of celebrations but mainly as we say there were celebrations on a more kind of a technical aspect of menstruation Um, celebrating, um, you know, the, the fabrication, the making of sanitary products, for instance, we didn't find so far, um, you know, many celebration in the way that we have just seen, you know, celebrating disability. Uh, menstruation is still not something that is out in the open in the street for everybody to rejoice and, and talk about. So at least we didn't find much of that yet. So maybe that's the conversation we could be having now. So Emily, um, voilà, je ne sais pas si 
tu veux commencer à, 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 à dire quelque chose or if we have any, any questions about what we, we have a question from Brooke, Claudie. So Brooke, would you like to ask a question? Yes, hi. Um, I just wanted to maybe ask about, um, I know like recently in there's some like Western celebrities who have been kind of doing free bleeding and things to, to destigmatize menstruation and periods. But um, then on the other hand, those sorts of like celebrating the blood and free bleeding practices maybe aren't appropriate in, in African contexts where there are high HIV AIDS levels and, you know, you actually really shouldn't be free bleeding and, you know, touching other people's blood and things like that. So are there, yeah, just kind of a, a question, I guess, about the, the way celebration might differ between different cultures and societies and how we can like have African celebrations. Okay. Uh, I don't know, Nelly, do you want to actually translate in writing? Okay. Uh, Emil, Emily, si vous voulez regarder dans la conversation, comme ça tout est traduit. Um, so the, 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 la question c'est est-ce que dans le contexte, dans le contexte africain, uh, par exemple, on a vu au nord beaucoup de célébrités qui qui font le, qui font de, le, enfin, qui parlent de, de, de tout ce qu'on appelle le free flow, donc euh, laisser, laisser couler les règles, ne pas se servir de protection. Est-ce que peut-être en, en est-ce que peut-être dans le contexte africain, euh, il y a des, 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 des obstacles, par exemple, autour peut-être de pays où, euh, avec la cause de l'incidence du sida, où le, le fait voilà, de, laisser, de laisser voir le sang ou de laisser couler le sang serait peut-être un, un, un frein à, aux célébrations Donc, est-ce que vous pouvez penser à certaines célébrations qui ne pourraient pas être faites de la même manière, en fait, en, dans certains pays et notamment dans certains pays en Afrique J'y vais, je, je peux répondre. Oui. Uh, will you translate, Nelly, in the chat? Yeah, OK. So read the chat to get the answer in English. Uh -huh. D'accord. Alors, moi, je ne sais, sais pas si c'est le cas dans toute l'Afrique de l'Ouest, mais principalement en Côte d'Ivoire, là où je vis, euh, les règles, c'est encore perçu comme quelque chose qu'on doit, qu doit cacher. Donc, salissante, mm -hmm. même si on, on essaie de, de prôner l'embusement et on est encore dans, on est dans, dans la dynamique de, de, de protection hygiénique en fait ici. Donc nous, on ne va pas faire de célébration pour, pour apprendre aux femmes à, à peut-être assumer ou à se passer de, des célèbres périodiques ou d'autres ou formes de, de protection, mais c'est plus de rendre disponibles les protections ici. C'est le principal défi ici en Côte d'Ivoire parce que il euh, y a le manque de, de serviettes périodiques. Ce n'est pas, pas vraiment accessible pour tout le monde. En moyenne, ça coûte 500 francs. 500 francs, c'est le prix d'un kilo de riz, alors qu'on est dans une population assez pauvre. Donc, nous, ce qu'on fait sur place, c'est vrai qu'on essaie de, de lever le tabou, mais c'est que les femmes parlent du fait que euh, les serviettes périodiques, les protections ne sont pas accessibles. On parle plus du fait de, de lever les taxes sur les protections hygiéniques, pardon. Euh, on parle aussi du fait de, de la disponibilité de l'eau. Parce que tout à l'heure, j'ai vu les serviettes qui sont faites euh, en tissu, en, en tissu wax. Ça, c'est vrai que c'est réutilisable, mais dans des contrats où il n'y a pas du tout d'eau, c'est compliqué. C'est plus euh, ces défis-là qui sont à notre niveau ici. Après, c'est comme une pyramide hein, des besoins. Donc, quand on, a, quand on va régler ce besoin d'accessibilité, je pense qu'on pourra passer à autre chose. Mais pour le moment, c'est principalement ça le défi ici en Côte d'Ivoire. Après, moi, en tant que blogueuse sexuelle, comme je l'ai dit dans la vidéo, euh, c'est de contribuer en tout cas à libérer la parole autour des règles. Parce que tant qu'on reste... Euh, on reste là à dire que c'est de la saleté, c'est quelque chose qu'il faut cacher. On ne va jamais parler des problèmes qui sont liés euh, aux règles des jeunes filles, des adolescents. Thank you, Emily. Um, just give a few seconds for Nelly to catch up with the translation. And then I think um, Katarina had uh, provided an answer in the chat. Um, Hi. 
Ah non, c'est ok, that was your translation. Ok, ok. So, Katarina, do you want to say something? Yes, but uh, in Portuguese, it's better to speak in Portuguese. You do. Yes. Really okay. Translate. Okay, thank you. Um, eu penso que em, em África o sangue é, é tabu, é tabu porque é algo que não é falado no contexto, mesmo no contexto familiar, não é algo que é partilhado por todos os membros da família. É algo que é falado somente por um certo grupo restrito, como é o caso das mulheres, mais velhas, mães e filhas. No caso em que existem rapazes ou homens neste num, num determinado agregado familiar, esta informação não é discutida com todos os membros da família, o que significa que deve-se criar um fórum restrito para discussão deste, deste, deste assunto. Então, esta forma como este assunto é tratado, como é discutido, faz com que seja uma limitação para que este assunto seja celebrado. Porque se o assunto é cele... se o assunto deve ser falado publicamente, não é problema, pode-se discutir por todos os membros da família, este assunto não pode criar barreiras para ser celebrado. Mas a forma como tratamos acaba sendo um tabu e acaba sendo uma limitação para ser celebrado. Obrigada. I'm sorry, I think I messed up um, the writing. I don't know if you got it all together. Katarina was saying that indeed blood is a taboo and is not spoken up openly in African societies, especially in Mozambique. It is spoken of by women together, but boys and men are often excluded from these discussions. Okay, I'm translating back into French. This is a bit tedious. Um, yeah, and that was the conclusion to Katarina that, you know, as, as long as we cannot talk about it, even within the family, there's very little space to actually take it out really in the, in the open, out of the family circle. Um, Ibrahim has a question. Your hand is up. Yeah, it's not like, but I just want to share some reflection from our festival because there was an issue that came up about um, menstruation during our, our festival in November. So actually from our side here, um, menstruation is a high taboo and it's been practiced in the secret and people don't want to talk about it in the open. So there was an example from a lady from one of the informal settlements who was about talking about um, menstruation. We gave her the opportunity to talk to the population about the festival. So as her, when she started talking about there is no enough space for them to practice proper sanitation. Like in the informal settlement, they don't have a space for women, like for toilets. They all use the same toilet, both men. So sometimes they need that kind of space where they can go in and have enough time to clean themselves and then change properly to come out. But most of the time, when they are in this process, you often people often come to knock at the door wanting to use the same toilet maybe most of the time it is men that are on the door wanting to come and use the same toilet. So that actually disturbs them on how to clean themselves during this menstruation. So as I said earlier, it's actually a taboo for us here because even me that is talking about it, I never had the opportunity to know about these things. And I don't even feel like talking, of, talking about it as a man. It's been practiced here secretively, so it's not in the open. So even those who want to talk about it in the open, they look at them into different eyes. Oh, these people, they are not ashamed. So or maybe they, they are just that kind of hearted people to talk about things that should be discussed in the secret. Yeah. 
Donc, et, et, ce que, OK, actually, what Ibrahim, you are saying, um, we also heard it in some other conversations that we had, particularly, and we will be producing a few um, audios around that for the overdue project. But many of these issues came up with students at university around the issue of toilets, the fact that students do not have separate uh, female uh, toilets. Um, and they actually said what you were saying, you know, how, how this is actually really, well, even in even in, during those weeks when they do not menstruate, it's uncomfortable. Um, but during menstruation time, it's even more, um, more, um, yeah, more of an issue exactly for the reasons that you were saying now. So, Emily, just pour dire rapidement, ce que ce qu'Ibrahim disait, c'est que pour les pour les femmes, elles disent dans l'espace public quand les toilettes, notamment, sont pas sont on, ne sont pas enfin sont mixtes, que pendant les règles, notamment, les femmes, elles ont jamais le temps de, elles, elles ont besoin de plus de temps dans les toilettes, elles ont pas le temps de se laver, elles ont pas le temps de se changer. Il y a toujours quelqu'un qui vient à la porte, toujours des gars qui sont là à la porte pour dire dépêchez-vous, sortez. Et on a entendu, nous, beaucoup la même chose, des étudiantes, notamment dans les universités, qui, euh, qui disent que si, voilà, s'il n'y a pas des toilettes séparées, c'est vraiment, c'est vraiment compliqué. En temps normal, mais en plus, euh, voilà, en plus pendant la, la période de règles. I don't know if you want to react, Emily or Katarina, to this. Okay, we have somebody from Madagascar, Miali, who says, in Madagascar, Oh, okay. Menstruation, they're not even taboo. They are just like, uh, what is uh, maudit? Um, malditas. Um, comment on dit en anglais? Um, like a curse. It's a curse. They are a curse. Yeah, so in Madagascar, it's not even that they are taboo. They are just a curse. Um, I think we need to wrap up but thank you very much for your questions anyway it's a very important topic and i'm pretty sure that it's not the end of it uh, we will definitely explore more in the future thank you okay thank you very much uh julia for the very good facilitation and those who have asked questions thank you very much now, Nelly Lebron will now present the result of our mentee survey for discussions. And after that, Professor Adriana Allen will make a give uh, final thoughts and reflection on today's discussion. How about you, Nelly? Thank you, Tim. Um, Alban, could you just refresh it? Because I'm surprised this is the uh, main taboos that came up. Mine is missing. Mine is missing too. So, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I don't want to um, monopolize the conversation. We really, this is really a discussion and we're uh, looking forward to hearing different discussions on taboos that you might have identified and would like to discuss, but that are not yet here. So if we look now at what's written, um, as taboos, we have the question of menstruation, sexual health, female hygiene, that maybe we've been uh, discussing in the last uh, presentation with Claudie, Emily, Katarina, Ibrahim. Also the question of a new one that we didn't mention at all, uh, prostate cancer, which I think is quite an interesting one. And I um, would be interested if someone wants to elaborate or bounce back on this, which I guess is taboo in many places. Terminology, I would take to echo the discussions on the word we use to mention taboos. Claudie is saying that we should also look at the intersections between different taboos. So for example, menstruating when facing a disability. I'm going to switch to Portuguese and French. Um, in the chat, so if ever someone else wants to jump in the discussion, they're welcome. Can I? 
Claudine, yes. Uh, I'd like to ask a question to, to Emily um, because we, we heard a lot about the, you know, some of the difficulties of uh, approaching some issues in the, the, the celebration for disabled people. And you talk a lot about sexual health and sexual in, well, you're a sex blogger. Is the issue of sexuality and sexual health for disabled people a subject that you actually tackle? Je voulais savoir si Emily, dans ton blog, est-ce que la question justement du handicap et de la sexualité, c'est quelque chose qui... que tu abordes? Euh, pas spécifiquement dans... Sur mon blog, en tout cas, je n'ai pas encore commencé, mais euh, j'ai participé à, à une cause et il y avait pas mal de personnes en situation de handicap ou alors des parents de personnes vivant avec un, un handicap qui voulaient justement que, euh, que j'inclue ça dans, dans mes prises de parole. Il euh, y a aussi, moi, de ce côté où je ne me sens pas vraiment totalement légitime, en fait, pour parler de, de sexualité de personnes vivant avec euh, un handicap, mais... Euh, J'ai une amie qui est dans une organisation euh, de, de, de femmes euh, en situation de handicap et avec elle, j'ai un projet de, de faire pas mal d'activités ou même des articles euh, sur la sexualité de, de, de cette catégorie de femmes. Donc, c'est un projet. Mmh. I just want to... Thank you. Merci, Emily. I just want to echo um, Brooke, who's saying that her taboo has gone missing, and I, my taboos have gone missing. So there is something maybe not working. Maybe we can con continue that collection of taboos that we would want to tackle next time in another space, because uh, I think it was really important to also open up our minds on what the taboos are and, and get your contributions. Um, donc, Emily, je, je disais juste que voilà, on a des tabous qui ont disparu. Les personnes qui ont mis des tabous qui ne sont pas apparus, on va peut-être continuer cette conversation euh, dans un autre espace où on peut continuer comme ça, avoir l'esprit ouvert euh, et peut-être euh, aussi enrichir notre vision de quels sont les tabous qu'on euh, qu pourrait explorer ou qu'on pourrait discuter. I have to apologize, it might be my fault because I'm a technological failure. I saw, I set it up and I don't think I did it well. There are many more things there, so we'll try and download it and share it in the final video. And maybe before that, we can hand over to Adriana for some closing thoughts. Sure, thanks for that. Uh, perhaps what we can do is even reopen again. <laughs> the, I also didn't see my, my contributions, but we could reopen it because we want to continue this conversation. There was another one on the chat, what about mental health? And I'm sure that we're all like, you know, uh, just crying with new issues that we want to put to the table. Um, so again, remember this is only the beginning of a conversation, not the end at all. Um, I know I'm very aware of the time. We are 15 minutes over the promised time with people leaving. So I'm going to be very, very brief, um, um, partly because, I mean, I live like with all of you, like all of you with lots of, you know, things I want to continue thinking about and definitely with a feeling that this is a conversation to be continued and a line of work and action that needs to be continued. Just a few thoughts or takeaways. Um, the first one is I think that what we saw across the three discussions, um, sanitation, when it comes to sanitation, disability, or menstruation, we saw that taboos work in two ways that are very linked. So they either exclude, silence, alienate, stigmatize people because of who they are or because of what they do. And in fact, the two are very linked. And this is something that came very, very clearly, I think, in, in all the three presentations. And this is, I think, something as well that we started to unearth in one of the last discussions around the intersectionality of taboos, how multiple identities come together, become associated with things that shouldn't be done because of what you are. So clearly, I mean, that's, that helps us to, I suppose, to remind us of how watchful we need to, to be about the way in which taboos, the efficiency of taboos, how efficient are taboos in reproducing these forces of alienation and exclusion endlessly, even beyond what we tend to think. Um, a second thing that I thought that was quite um, also interesting and coming through the discussion um, had to do with um, 
the notion of collectivizing. I thought that, you know, all of you were saying, well, actually, one of the key points, if we go back to the idea of celebration and celebrating taboos or changing or challenging through celebration of other means, uh, taboos, the key point is to break the isolation of those who are the subject of the taboo. And I think that this is very important. So becoming part of a collective. And there were many references to that. No, we cannot have that conversation, Katarina was saying, in the family because we don't have it in the society. Um, and, and so, of course, starting these conversations is extremely important uh, because, because it collectivizes. It uh, helps us to understand that what I think is just of, because of me, my problem and so on, actually, you know, is, is, is very much um, a shared field, a shared field that is subjected to action as well. I thought there was another point that was very interesting about the very delicate um, um, balance between who is involved in the celebration of a taboo, who drives it. So, of course, we heard about, you know, uh, the importance of, I mean, in some cases, uh, the driving of a taboo was from outside those that were, say, for instance, you know, uh, experiencing open defecation. Uh, but uh, as people took over, yeah, reappropriated the celebration with new meanings. Uh, in the case of disability, we saw people driving that from within and so on. So this question of, you know, again, who drives it, and if not, if the celebration is not driven right from the beginning by those subjects, you know, how are they included? When do they find their voice? And when do they find something that was very interesting that someone was saying, uh, this possibility of changing the language yeah, uh, with respect? Um, there was, I thought, another point uh, which was very interesting around the notion that celebration uh, and challenging taboos through celebration can build confidence. To speak about the taboo can obviously also build recognition, but I think that there was a lot of emphasis as well on uh, the actions, the impacts that can be built. And I, I noticed many of the questions were exactly about that, but so what? You know, we, we did the celebration and so what changed after that? Clearly, most of you said the conversation changed or it started to change, um, some actions follow, people themselves change uh, in being part of a different uh, uh, conversation and so on. And uh, I think as someone said, uh, it wasn't only the changing of the language, but the possibility of standing your ground. And I think that we have to be, this is not a uh, challenge in a taboo, it's not like a project where you implement, you build, you know, uh, new pipes and so on and, 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 and whatever, you know, you have certain uh, improved access to something. Challenging the taboo means really undoing something that is so naturalized that we hardly see it. So obviously it's, it's, uh, it's an invitation to be, you know, uh, for very long uh, term work. Um, I just find that I think that, you know, the most, perhaps the final thing to say is that I think that the challenging of taboos, the identification and the challenging of taboos through celebration, again, or other means, is extraordinarily political. And I think that this is what transpired. It's not just uh, something that has to do with cultural norms, where we venture into agitating cultural norms. It's an extraordinarily political um, uh, process and means because of what uh, taboos do. Taboos do things that are extraordinarily political. So I stop here, conscious of the time, and I thank you very much for the provocations. Uh, we are definitely going to continue uh, this conversation. We pose, I hope that we can see again um, um, an updated and more full-fledged um, uh, mentee uh, meter with all your propositions, but do please uh, get in touch uh, if you want to, to continue this conversation in any way. Tim, the floor is yours. Thank you. I just want to take this opportunity, as what Adriana said, to thank you all of you for your very constructive uh, ideas and uh, questions and comments. And uh, I don't have much to do. Maybe if Julia, you want to say any last words, please do that and close the session. No, thank you, Tim. I think you said everything. So yeah, thanks everyone. And I really enjoyed the session. Bye.